Hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Wise uh, webinar of the month. As most of you all know, I'm Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And um, you have been hearing and uh, been participating in many such waste dialogues on monthly basis, uh, addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management since 2013. Uh, Be Waste Wise is a non-profit organization and we have been bridging this uh, waste solution expertise gap worldwide for over a decade now. Uh, if you see the value in making such diverse sustainability dialogues are free of charge for anyone and everyone, then please support us in our mission. Uh, we encourage you all to do check out our website and donate as we all share the link uh, to the donation page over the chat as well. Uh, moving on to the topic of the webinar today, we will highlight and discuss the pressing issues related to the solid waste management in Africa. We'll explore how uncontrolled dump sites and landfills, uh, weak organizational structures, lack of appropriate skills, uh, and many such things, and most, most importantly, low public awareness is leading to the current scenario. We have with us today uh, Nagozika, who's the newest moderator of Be Waste Wise. She was born and educated in the United Kingdom, but decided to relocate and come back to Zambia, her mother homeland. And she started the Bright Future Project. Her organization is extremely uh, hardworking and working towards making Zambia the center of the environmental revolution and reform by creating a tech inclusive, efficient and effective waste management systems, which can be replicated in all the regions of Zambia and other African nations. Today, Nagozika, along with the esteemed panel, will highlight how uh, bringing waste under control in Africa and unlocking the opportunities that waste can provide as a resource will require immediate intervention by the government, business and civil society. To discuss this, we have on this panel today uh, Piotrick, who is a Circular Economy Program Manager from the African Circular uh, Economy Network, ASIN Foundation. He's a seasoned circular economy expert with more than 12 years of experience uh, in developing uh, waste-related policies at not only EU level, but also at national and city level. His current work at the ASIN Foundation involves the strategic development of the circular economy programs across African region, the development of circular economy roadmaps and action plans and so on. Uh, second, we have on the panel is Ola Pozi, who is the manager for Africa from Adam Smith's International with over 15 years of uh, invaluable experience spanning the private sector and international development arenas. Ola Pozi work on the urban and infrastructural portfolio with a focus on driving sustainable progress across the continent. He's currently uh, managing FCDO's uh, flagship waste management program in Tanzania under the Green Cities and Infrastructure Program. We also have Rolf, who is the director of uh, Grassroots Trust Limited, which is a non-profit in Zambia focused on ground on helping communities shape a viable future by using and promoting the holistic management framework to guide decision making and to contribute to a regenerating environment and resilient income streams in Zambia. Today, uh, he will talk about the source segregation of waste and public awareness on managing organized waste, and also to throw light on how waste can provide as a resource and uh, you know how the other areas related to government and business and civil society play a big role in that. So now before we proceed to the exciting discussion, I would like to make a few announcements. And uh, this webinar is uh, being recorded and will be uploaded uh, on our website and YouTube channel. Uh, please use the Q&A section for your questions to the panel, and we encourage you to have maximum questions as possible uh, for this panel and have this constructive uh, conversation build upon on this very crucial topic. We also would request you to please use a chat function to uh, give your views, to network, to share what you're expecting, where you're joining from, to connect with the panelists. So we request you to please use uh, these functions separately um, for the questions, the Q&A section, and for the chat, for the discussions, the chat function. Uh, so back to the topic and uh, over to you, Nagazika. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for um, inviting me to be um, a new moderator on the Be Waste Wise, um, on the Be Waste Wise um, um, platform. Um, it's an it's a absolute privilege for me to be here. 
My name is Ngozika Victoria Onyekwelu. Um, I think a brief introduction of me was 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 very well done. Um, I am um, a British-born, um, half Zambian, half Nigerian um, lady. I decided in twenty twenty four that um, I wanted to tackle. Sorry, in 2014, sorry, that I wanted to tackle the issue of um, waste in Zambia. Um, I couldn't understand why um, it was not being used as a resource. So I'm coming um, onto this platform purely um, as somebody who started um, this project from a passion. So um, I'm not a waste management um, professional or educated um, on, waste, on waste management. This came purely from a passion um, of mine. And um, I'm very, again, as I said, I'm very happy to be on this platform with the wonderful panelists here. The aim of us today is to um, focus on Africa and try and tackle the issue of illegal dump site, illegal dump sites and landfills. Um, we're going to tackle this issue from, from a policy level, from an environmental level, and from a social level. And um, at the end of the day, we're hoping that we can all gain um, a lot of knowledge on firstly, why these dump sites are being so unregulated. And secondly, what solutions do we have in order um, to tackle this, this, um, this issue? Um, are they, are the dump sites, um, can we put the dump sites in a section where they are part of the circular economy? So waste is a resource and we have these huge dumps all over Africa. How are we going to tackle this issue? So I'm very interested in hearing what the panelists have to say. I'm very interested on, um, looking at the questions that the audience have and i'm really hoping that we will all take something away from us that we can actually use practically because it's easy to talk um it's not so easy to actually to actually take action so let's see if we can take action um, on this issue um at the end of this day today so um <clears throat> I don't want to go. To, I don't want to explain too much about the Bright Future project. Um, I think my LinkedIn profile has been shared, and my company profile has been shared as well. I'm happy to um, take on questions about my project um, after um, the webinar. But just um, a two-minute overview of the Bright Future project. Um, we collect um, separated waste from households. Um, with the aim um, of recycling um, the, the waste. Um, unfortunately, we're very small and haven't been able to get investment. So we haven't reached the stage of recycling. So we're simply aggregates and sell to bigger recyclers um, for now. We also um, in tandem run um, um, workshops and education programs as well. Um, we have run workshops for the Ministry of Commerce and for other foundations like the Zambian Governance Foundation and um, for the Italian Embassy and for other organizations um, who wish to learn more. For private companies such as Puma and Lafarge, Coca-Cola and Nestle, um, we have um, all gone there and tried to, to help them um, um, design um, waste management um, mechanisms within their companies that can reduce um, the flow of packaging post consumer stage. So we have a lot on the ground that we've been that we've been trying to do. We've been focusing again, as I said, on rural areas as well, um, focusing on um, women, ch children, and young men, um, teaching them rudimentary ways and how they can recycle their own plastics and glass, and trying to trying to inspire them to look at their waste as a resource and inspire them to create businesses from that. So that is where I'll end on the Bright Future Project. And um, I want to now introduce our panelists. And um, if we can have five minutes, um, Pietro, with you first, so that um, you can tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll move on to our next panelist.
Okay, yes, hi, hi, Ngozika, and hi, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure if I should, should share the screen yet. No, uh, later. Okay. So just introduction, okay. So my name is Piotr, or Piotrek. I work at the ASEN Foundation, which stands for African Circular Economy Network Foundation. And I am European with a lot of European background, uh, but I work for a few years already with a whole bunch of colleagues, experts in almost every country in Africa, and, and uh, I see a lot of familiar faces so and names here. I see colleagues from, from Prevent Waste Alliance, which is also a platform that is very, very useful for exchange of uh, uh, knowledge between the North and the South, and the South and the North. So uh, I will elaborate today a bit on um, the governance issues or governance uh, also opportunities. In fact, there is a lot of collaboration between Europe and uh, Africa, and I will just briefly explain that, uh, that can also inspire you to, to know uh, which, which doors to knock uh, in order to look at improvement of your waste management, which I prefer now to maybe uh, put in the context of circular economy. I will speak about that a lot. But of course, we are all aiming for circular economy and zero waste, but there is still residual waste out there and actually in on the African continent because of uh, substandard or not very efficient waste management schemes, there is still a lot of residual waste. So waste that is going to dump sites. And I will address that. How actually to leapfrog from this situation, leapfrog our European mistakes to a more sustainable, uh, inclusive, um, future-proof system that is also climate friendly. So that's from me, but I will have a few slides to show. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, can we, um, um, Oloposi, um, would you kindly um, tell us, give us a five minute introduction about what you do? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I can't, I can't shout, I, I don't know if you could uh, bring up my slide now. Um, um, thank you all for joining this. Um, Webinar. My name is Alako Sefalope. I'm a Nigerian based in Nigeria and um, doing some work uh, across Africa. Um, I think waste management is the conversation of waste management um, is ongoing in different fora, but I, I don't think we can. Um, we can exhaust the things that need to be discussed today. And uh, I think someone, I think um, it was you, Ongozika, when you were doing your opening speech, the need to, you know, move away from talking to doing. Uh, but this this afternoon uh, or morning, depending on where you are, I'll be speaking to um, the work that we do um, on waste management in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Of course, I've done, um, some work on waste management here in Nigeria to looking at um, uh, the root causes of the issues that are constraining that sector in terms of capacity, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of finance across the different geopolitical zones in Nigeria, especially in Lagos. Um, currently, I'm a manager in Adam Smith International and I work within the urban and infrastructure um, space. Um, Adam Smith is also a member of a consortium that is implement, currently implementing the Green Cities and Infrastructure Program, which is funded by the, the UK government, FCDO. Now, um, um, a, a key component of that program is the Dar es Salaam Urban Resilience Program, which started sometime in, um, it started in January. We, we had the first phase in January, looking at, looking at organic waste uh, across a, a few markets and how those um, those have been ma currently managed, we're currently managed, and the, the things that need to be done to, to deal with the issues there. But just in July this year, we started a, a second phase, which will run from July 1st to um, March 31st next year. And what we are doing on that is, um, and just to set a bit of context, I, I can share, please, could you go to the next, uh, next um, slide? Right, so context is um, the fact that across Africa, you have that population growth um, that is, you know, that seems to be growing faster than the infrastructure on ground um, are growing. And so the effect of that is becoming, um, you know, visible to all of us 
Um, we also have rap rapid urban urbanization. A lot of people moving from uh, a lot of people moving from the the various rural locations now coming to urban locations, and then that creating an impact on the infrastructure and the ability of the government to quickly respond to uh, what what is required, especially in the context of waste management. There's also then now um, uh, growth in environmental degradation, which is now which is becoming a lot more visible than in the past. You could easily see um, the impact of um, inefficient waste management on your environment now more than you could in the past, right? And I, I think I mentioned earlier on infrastructure deficit, the fact that the population is growing now, a lot of people are now moving to urban regions means that uh, infrastructure uh, that currently exists or that you had 10 years ago, um, which is not improved as um, at the rate at which the population has grown, is now you know, seriously overwhelmed and unable to deal with the, the needs or the requirements. Um, if, if, a little more on what we are doing on this in, in Dar es Salaam. Next slide, please, I, I can share. In Dar es Salaam, what we are doing is um, to look at six different um, um, areas of addressing these issues. We have two components of our work. We've got six components of our work. One focused on organic waste management and treatment. Uh, another this we are essentially doing, um, we've identified the need to um, have data to be able to understand what waste are generated, where are this waste generated, what volume are generated, and what could be done, um, what needs to be done in terms of ensuring this um, infrastructure to deal with, with, with those kind of waste. Um, and so we're doing in the organic waste management, that's a key component of what we are doing is the assessment of that sector and the, the, the different um, volume of waste coming out. But we're also then working on uh, composting as uh, or processing of organic waste in that sector, knowing that a, a, a number of um, initiatives are, a number of private sector players are already um, doing some work in this space, but they are constrained by certain things. Right, so this component is focused on identifying what those constraints are and how they could be supported. Knowing that if they're well supported and those constraints are least lifted, they will be able to scale and the impact would be uh, quite um, useful to the entire community or the entire city of Dar es Salaam. We also have a company that is focused on it, uh, on um, on recycling transformation and better integration of Dar es Salaam's recycling sector. Now, this is also quite heavy on data collection, understanding especially around five key recyclable waste, understanding um, what is happening in the formal space, but also in the informal space. Dar es Salaam, like Nigeria, has got a lot of um, um, activities happening in the informal recycling space. And because of the informality, um, those things are not um, essentially captured by anyone. And there's very little data on what is available. So we're trying to get um, primary and secondary data to make sure that um, there is clarity, a clear view of what's happening in those sectors and how they could be supported. We have got a third component, and I know that this would also happen. Everybody, this would also come up later. Every um, a critical issue um, that is affecting waste management across Africa is access to finance, finance to put the infrastructure there, finance to also, you know, um, take the key the key actions that need to be taken, and so. We've got a company that is focused on um, working with the city of Dar es Salaam to access climate finance, and and that's on the on the back of the climate uh, impact that could be you know created when a waste management is properly managed. Another thing that's an issue is capacity building, and so we are do doing some sig significant work working with government and key stakeholders to improve capacity um, and ensure that they understand and they're able to do the things that need to be done, and. We also have a component on tech, which will, you know, look to identify what's, uh, what the challenges are in both in the organic waste management and the recycling, but also then see how technology is being used in developed uh, continents um, and how technology can be used to solve this and to increase, to achieve some efficiency in that, um, in that space. Um, this would, would, will be hosting sometime in January, February, Next year, we'll be hosting a hackathon. And then after then, um, look to get these ideas uh, 
um, funded and hit the ground running. And the final one on our, comp on our project would be looking at um, GAG emissions and the modeling that just understanding what level of emissions are we recording currently in Dar es Salaam and when our interventions are, are fully um, uh, done, what impact we expect to have on GAG. So together, all these components are the things that we'll be focusing on. I must mention that this project is also largely, um, is working largely with the World Bank um, Dar es Salaam Metropolitan Development Program in um, phase two in, in, in Tanzania, that also, which is a bigger waste management program. Um, I'll pause here. I know that we'll still have some other conversations as this goes on, but this is just an overview of what, um, what I'm managing um, together with the team in, uh, in Dar es Salaam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've already started getting some questions coming in. Rolf, could you kindly also just give us a, a two five minute introduction about um, your foundation in Zambia? And um, once that is done, we'll, we'll go straight into the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Ngozika. And thank you to BY's team for giving us the opportunity to talk about things. Um, I'm Rolf Shinton. I'm a Zambian. I live in Zambia, lived in Zambia, and I got involved in other people's problems in 91 when we uh, had a change of government. And suddenly I was elected as a leader and I was uh, overwhelmed with people's problems. And, you know, in general, um, we had to boil down what we could do and what we can't do. And for me, the biggest problem as a farmer is this massive, you know, desertification or general trend. If you see the picture behind me, um, we're going from a lot of plants and a lot of animals to a desert. And that is the general trend in our part of the world. Um, and as Olaposi says that, you know, there's a lot of people moving to, to the cities probably because of this desertification, um, which kind of accelerates it, right? There's a lot of food, there's a lot of fiber, there's a lot of energy going to town, a lot of organic matter, and it's not going back to the land. So um, that's where I come in with recycling. Um, I'm concerned in general about that picture. Uh, of all the nutrients ending up in town, in, in land bills and uh, sewage ponds, and not getting back out to the land. So I think that's the general opportunity which, which uh, is there for us now, is to, is to look at that. And I'll talk more about it in my presentation. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much, Rolf. So um, Piotr, I'm going to um, focus on you for, for, for the next, um, few minutes or so, and I'll dive into my first question. As part of the circular economy community, do you think Africa is doing enough to explore development opportunities within the waste sector? Thank you, Ngozika. Yeah, um, let me share my screen. I have prepared one slide on this exactly. And here it is. Um, well, this is part of the answer. Of course, there is, there is, we could talk hours and hours about that. So, okay, I hope you see the slide. Mm, so this is the slide. Um, here you can see that there is actually, I want, I want to take it from a positive view. There is an, a development opportunity. Uh, Africa can take it straight from, from uh, under, I, I cannot close this file here, nice, okay. Okay, I don't know how you see this, but uh, okay, hope you see the, uh, all the screen. So um, Africa can take it from a positive stance because there is a lot of uh, money go being flown in, uh, into the continent and um, different countries, different regional programs. There are different institutions. The topic today is also about governance, whether it's a failure or it is a development opportunity. I want to, of course, nothing is black and white, but I want to focus on the positive side 
that even if so far that we've seen, of course, governance failures, very significant at regional level, at national level, city level, uh, but uh, with those different programs and the development of circular economy approach, which is more and more recognized among different uh, experts and stakeholders and, and governments as well at uh, national level, but also at the African Union level. So uh, our organization, ASEN Foundation, we developed a circular economy roadmap, which is a set of policies, how to go step by step to implement circular economy in the countries. So those, this roadmap is being trickled down into each and every country. Each and every country in Africa was participating in development of this program, of this, yeah, uh, let's say, strategic agenda. They will take, different countries will take it, will adjust it as they want, because there are different priorities in these countries. There are different sectors that are major, um, that have to be also moved from linear to circular. So, uh, so each country will do it differently, but there are many different programs to do that. There is African Development Bank that's, that actually is supporting currently five countries to develop their own programs. There is the ASEAN uh, network, uh, and I see also colleagues from the uh, from the network here. So it's a network of um, a lot of experts and that do different projects in almost all countries as well. Uh, that there, there are focal points. And so I invite you, African colleagues, to get in touch with the chapter leads of the ASEAN network. There is ASEA, which is the, um, let's say, uh, a group of governments that are ambitious enough to take the challenge, to stand up to the challenge. Of course, there are UN um, agencies uh, involved, and each and every of them have um, uh, um, a circular economy priority as well, an objective. Uh, so, so there is this governance um, aim to go into this, into circular economy, to move from inefficient waste management that, uh, that results in a lot of dump sites. And I want to dif differentiate one question from Derek was about that. There are dump sites, but there are also well-managed landfills. And there is a role for the, um, for those landfills there. Um, I don't know if you want to you want to uh, ask me other questions, or shall I also, I mean, go with the flow? You're muted. Apologies for that. Um, I just wanted to um, elaborate on when you talked about um, the circular economy now um, seeping through Africa to national level. I agree with you. Um, in Zambia, four years ago, um, the Ministry of um, Envi of of Green Economy and Environment was established which is um, a ministry solely dedicated to the functions of the circular economy, whether it be water, waste, or energy, and so on and so forth. My question to you is that, um, do you think such organizations are going to be um, effective? And do you think that um, people on a governmental level in Africa um, are know enough about the circular economy to act, to be able to create policy and implement it effectively? Um, there are countries, there are cities where there are lo lots of uh, experts that are being consulted as well. Uh, so we cannot say overall in Africa, it's dif difficult or it's good. Um, uh, but yes, of course, existence of those high level institutions is not enough. All of this has to trickle down to municipal level. And this slide, I want to show you that, in fact, the responsibility is on municipalities. We need a solid skills in all municipalities because this is on their shoulders in the end. Waste management is on their shoulders. And with this formula that was developed by my colleague from Zero Waste Europe, Jack, it shows you that actually it is possible to achieve even 90% separate collection of waste, so segregation of waste. And you know this is a prerequisite to recycle it. First, you have door-to-door -door collections, such as the one in Dar es Salaam, in the, in the ward of Bonyokwa. There, there is actually an expansion of, of this program as well. So uh, where, where you really take diligence to separately collect. Pay as you throw, so you pay uh, for the amount you actually throw away. It cannot be uh, just a blanket uh, payment, uh, not depending on how much you, wait, you waste. You know, you pay for electricity for how much you use the electricity. Why? Also, we cannot uh, differentiate and incentivize less waste creation by people. So here, I, if you see maybe the nuance, I wanna say that it's not only about people's awareness, it's about tools. 
if you if you as a government national government or local government you give tools such as differentiation of fees or or different or we simply provide waste bins that are separately uh, separate then by those mechanisms you nudge consumers to do the right thing deposit return systems it is very common in europe and i believe it, the time will come that it will also be there in africa so you know where you have a bottle you buy a, a bottle of Coca-Cola, let's say, you pay additional fee for the bottle, but when you give back the bottle, you receive back the, 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 the fee. So, you know, oh. here you incentivize the collection oh. and even the reuse, actually. And then the last point, point is maybe a bit complicated, is mixed waste sorting. So, uh, yes, we know that after all of this, you will still have uh, residual waste, mixed waste, so the leftover waste. But before that, going to landfill, it still has to be sorted out because there is still a, uh, there is evidence. There is still a lot of recyclables in it. There are there is glass, there is paper, there is organic waste mainly actually. And uh, even if it's already um, contaminated, it is still better to downcycle it than to uh, than to uh, than landfill or incinerate it. Um, and then. Um, you know, the, we often speak about methane emissions from dump sites, and it's true, yeah, that it's a problem. But what creates methane? It, methane is created by bio waste. So by sorting bio waste and focusing on this, first of all, you solve a big problem, a chunk of the problem, you reduce the methane emissions uh, are kind of in the origin. Oh. And, and then also you make other streams much cleaner because then that will be easier to recycle. And then you actually have a clean material, which I think um, uh, our colleague here, um, I will also be happy, farmers will be happy. You, you have compost, you will have compost of good quality organic waste. So, um, uh, yeah, okay, I, I finished here. And if you have more questions. I, I have a, yeah. a, a question from Diaz Simeo. I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name, Diaz, but the question is, the responsibility of municipalities needs to be reinforced. Any ex do you have any experience on their accountability and instruments in the region? In the African region, I guess. Yes. Yeah. There is not so much, I think, uh, but colleagues can uh, fulfill. Uh, in Europe, it is very much the case. The, the responsibility is trickled down to municipalities. And many municipalities take the approach of capping the residual waste generation. And many of them receive as low uh, uh, residual waste generation per capita as 30 kilograms per year per capita in many uh, in many Italian cities, for example. In Africa, I can only say Dar es Salaam is on a good path, and co colleagues are here also. It's it's still very difficult because it's a huge city, but it's going uh, in a good direction thanks to the zero waste model that is implemented there. I can paste the link here later. Zanzibar, also Tanzania, the city is also the first zero waste archipelago. I mean the, the whole archipelago. But Kigali uh, is also taking a, a good uh, good approach. Uh, and then there are, you know, it's difficult always to say it, something is black and white. There are some good approaches, but they're also very bad. You sometimes even contradicting. So yeah, but I agree. Uh, the, the responsibility has to be given more to municipalities and the funding to the municipalities. And here comes the EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, which might has to finance the activities of municipalities. Excellent. So when it comes to um, extended producer responsibility, we've got a question from Ronald. Yeah, I saw that. Can we expand that? And uh, uh, we, I am happy to respond later, also other colleagues. Okay. So the question is, um, what is the status? What is the status of extended producer responsibility regulations. Yeah, I said, I know, I saw that question. Let's park that. Let's talk about that later. Also, colleagues can do. Sure, um, that's fine. Um, that's, that's brilliant. So I'm going to now move on to um, Rolf. Um, Rolf is very um, passionate about the earth and has a lot of them. Um, um, holistic approaches as to how we can overcome um, some of these issues. So instead of waste going to the landfill, um, we've, um, we reduce, reuse, and, and so on and so forth. So Rolf, the first question to you is, what kind of economic and environmental damage can result from uncontrolled landfills 
And what areas of governance need to change when it comes to combating illegal dump sites? Thanks, Ngozika. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there's a nexus here between the farmer inputs, which have been chemical based and uh, imported here for a long time. And pretty much most of Africa doesn't produce fertilizer. Um, it was cheap in the 70s. Uh, a bag of fertilizer cost one bag of maize, basically. And now it costs six bags of maize to get a bag of fertilizer. So this is an opportunity, right? We also seen that the effect of putting chemical fertilizers is, is uh, reducing the fertility, taking us towards the desert. Um, and so we, we also see from an environmental point of view, it's much better to use organic waste. And there's millions of tons, millions of tons. Every household, I, I get shocked when I see household waste um, figures what people throw away. My son did an exercise at school just trying to reduce that waste because it's it's incredible how much food we waste. Mm -hmm. When you think of how many people are starving and there's no food, well, you know, each one of us, and, and I know I'm the same, we've got to try and recycle that. Um, obviously, we're going to try and reduce it, but we, we also got to make sure it recycles back to production mm -hmm. eventually. And that can be either, um, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities for vertical farming and uh, small small farming in in uh, urban areas but i think the the bigger the bigger picture would be to process all the um organic waste and the and the human waste um and get it back on the land and, and that that's got to replace fertilizer as fossil fuels become more expensive mm -hmm. so i think the opportunities are huge i think it really creates a lot of jobs for a lot of people along the the, the value chain um and i yeah like uh, piotra i really think that it's a it's a huge opportunity that governments are often missing um by being in this kind of 70s or where we were a socialist country where everything was done for everybody and it's kind of like that we're stuck in that mm -hmm. and if we see it as uh this is a business and a business opportunity i don't get the truck to come and collect waste from my house. Our, our yard here has three little houses, but we collect everything. We 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 um, process all the organic matter easily with uh, a wormery and the uh, and uh, compost heaps and a lot of the waste we just bury into the compost heaps or into into the garden um, as a quick way of uh, composting. Um, and then we grow quite a lot of food, but. I think everybody could do this. The, the big opportunity here is to replace fertilizer, which in Zambia is $500 million a year. Wow. And that's a big budget. <laughs> sure, there's a lot of opportunity for a lot of people. That creates money. Wow. $500 million of fertilizer, which is cooking our soils. And organic matter would make our soils better. Hmm. So, so, so a landfill like Chunga, which is this, which which was opened in the fifties, um, and from from what I know, it floods every year, and during the rainy season, and of course adds to the typhoid, cholera issue that we get every rain every rainy season. So you know, apart from the flooding, um, what other what other environmental damage do those kinds of landfills cause? I mean, it's been open what is it 60 70 years now yeah um, it's unbelievable unbelievable lack of imagination and uh you know there's so many people people come to my gate without shoes they're collecting waste i separate mm -hmm. and i think that's where it starts we all yeah. have to start separating yes. okay it's too easy to just dump it all in a bag and send it off to chunga yeah. but if we start separating and somebody's coming to collect you know, each week uh, people pitch up at my gate and they want uh, plastic bottles. Another guy wants uh, glass bottles. Another guy gets uh, plastic bags that are in good condition and uh, rewashes them and uses them for for uh, charcoal and other things to, to split up into small energy packs. There, there's a lot of opportunity. There are a lot of people involved. And I think that if government really get on board and make partnerships with these people, 
there's also a lot of companies downtown who are buying waste. Mm -hmm. There's other companies that are compressing and sending to South Africa because we don't process some of the stuff. So, you know, each one of these is opportunity and business opportunity and money and jobs and employment. And um, I just think that we, you know, policy is so far behind the people here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, 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 it's, you're kind of almost obliged to pay every month for the truck to come and collect your waste. But you know, it's a, it's probably an open truck. It's not even a closed truck. Half the, half the stuff gets blown off the back of it on the way to Chunga, to the dump site. And when it gets to the dump site, you can imagine when the, when the big heavy rains comes, okay, it's going to wash that through into our limestone soil. And that's going straight back into the water system. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just an unbelievable... Uh, that you could even think of carrying on with this, you know, yeah. when there's big opportunities. Yeah. Um, the open truck thing is a policy actually by Lusaka City Council. So if you're a waste management company and you want to start collecting waste, they want you to have an open truck for that. Um, I'm not sure why. But what I wanted to ask you, Rolf, is that in your interaction with governmental officials, when you're talking to them about um, waste management strategies and the circular economy, what have been your impressions? Are they eager to help? Do they just listen and, and, sh and you know, shake their head? Or have you met somebody who's actually proactive within the ministerial levels and who's willing to help? I tend to feel very deflated um, after meeting with people on the governmental level because I feel as though they see the problem, but it's not close enough to their hearts for them to act on it. Yeah, if I can answer that, I mean, uh, in my experience, having been in the decision-making circles for a while and... Um realizing that there wasn't much I could do there, I think is an institutional problem. I think that institutions on the whole tend to find difficulty in innovating. If you think of somebody coming into the system and then working their way up to the top, by the time somebody gets to the top, they've been in there 20 years, their ideas are 20 years old. Okay. And I think for a person to come in with new ideas and to innovate is very difficult. So I don't think that we could expect that leaders are going to change things. I think that communities and change comes from the bottom upwards. So, mm -hmm. And that's all we can hope, is that we can really get out there. We've got social media, which is an incredible tool, right? We can get to every single body just about now um, on these issues. And, um, you know, there's... That's where the change comes from. If we can show that these are opportunities for poor people to get involved and get and make a living, I think that's our best hope. The hope that somebody from the top is suddenly going to manage to change everybody downwards is, uh, well, it's never happened as far as I know. So mm. I doubt that it's going to okay. happen. Thank you very much, Rolf. Um, I'm now going to move on to um, Olaf. Olaf Bossi, I've got some questions for you. Uh, Gazika Piotrek has raised his hand. I think. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no yeah. worries. I yeah, just wanted to go. really just add on what Rolf said, uh, that yes, the, or, the change comes from organic, from bottom up, really. But uh, this also has to be systemic. Social media is great, but maybe not enough. So what is important is that we have the consultations, basically. Binding consultations where local communities are asked their opinions, their ideas, and they are taken up mandatory or chosen, you know, through different analysis as well, which, uh, uh, yeah, so that it really comes to the decision makers quick and not 20 years, as you said. Yeah. yeah. So consultations, and I don't know if it's happening enough in Africa, probably not, but here uh, it's, it's, it's very important for the civil society. Thank you very much. To be fair, our, our new ministry has been creating more forums for discussion on these issues, and I think that's that's all we can really expect from them. And getting the media involved, we now had a, had a media platform with a lot of journalists on the environment uh, uh, forum. And there's a lot more discussion for sure. And it's those forums that are very important. Agreed. Excellent, excellent. Um, um, my first question to you is, how important is, how important a role does waste management play within green cities? 
And do you think it's imperative for Africa to start making this transition in order to mitigate illegal dump sites the, the, um, and eliminate the use of landfills and encourage um, innovation? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think I just add to the last point by um, uh, Piotr on the fact that, I mean, in my experience, speaking with government officials regarding waste management, you would always um, see the need to, to advocate for them to, you know, be more participatory in their, in their approach to this um, conversation. Right, um, waste management by itself requires the participation of everybody, both from the policy angle, but also from the angle of the households or the sources of those waste. Right, and that participatory approach is something that needs to happen across all the channels that we have, whether it's social media, whether it's different fora, and all that. I've advocated this um, um, in different fora, and I think that. We are beginning to see, for instance, in Nigeria, we're beginning to see an increase in that approach in, um, in terms of how waste, ma waste, waste is managed. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, for instance, um, waste management is still largely a state, state um, at, at a state level. I haven't seen any local government um, waste management agency right which would which should bring this to the municipal level like um Piotr mentioned earlier on and i agree, totally agree it needs to go to the grass grassroots for it to be a lot more e effective and efficient uh, it also helps this all um connect with the people rather than when you're doing it from a country national level or from it from a state level now to your question on the role that um waste management will play can can play in in you know in in, in getting us in, in developing green cities, I, I think waste management would play a critical role um, in this transition, um, and that is that is multifaceted and of course essential for several reasons. So if you look at it from the environmental uh, protection um, point of view, there's a lot of pollution that comes up from. Uh, improper waste management, right? When waste are dumped in illegal waste um, dump sites and, and the likes, there's a lot of pollution that come from those and that, that goes to affect our environment and reduces how green our environment is, right? Things in terms of, um, Rolf mentioned how when the waste are dumped, toxic chemicals go into go through the soil, it goes back into the water and we see the impact on, on on human being, right? Um, Lagos, for instance, has done a lot in, in waste management, but there's a there's the big big problem when you're entering or you're about to leave Lagos State, where you see that big massive dump site. Um, if you're coming to Lagos from say another place of down um, southwest, you see that massive dump site by the entrance of the city with smoke coming out 24/7. Those are not good for the environment, and we all know that. So, from that angle. Um, proper waste management processes help to mitigate, uh, reduce um, in, in the in short to mid, medium time, but eventually goal is to mitigate against those kind of um, environmental impact. Uh, there, there's also the climate change mitigation that, um, that can happen when we reduce greenhouse gas emissions from, for example, from landfills. And I, I, I like the point that Piotr made earlier on uh, around Yes, where do what what causes the emission when when the waste gets to from the landfill? Isn't it's not there's something that causes the emission, but making sure those things that cause the emission don't get to waste management, a good don't get to the landfill, comes from proper waste management. So when there's no proper waste management, those things get to landfill, as we now see see them in a lot of our cities in Africa, and then cause us emissions, which um go go around to affect the 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 environment. There's also the resource efficiency. Um, that can also come from, you know, um, encouraging recycling and reuse of, um, of, of waste, right? Um, I think sometime in Nigeria when I was doing something like this, I found out that when you use recyclable waste, so sometimes when the cost of crude oil goes up, and I think this is still, Piotr will know this better, when the cost of crude oil goes up, the manufacturers of pets 
would want to use recyclable waste, recyclable space. They want to recycle because they feel it's cheaper to use to recycle than to go and buy um, well, the, the part of the, 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 the chemicals they use for manufacturing that. And, and so, but if we have a proper system in place, everybody's encouraged to recycle rather than going to use um, um, fresh raw materials that can put impact, that can place a, a, a prayer on, you know, on, on, on the environment in terms of generating raw materials, and, you know, and can also have that environmental degradation impact. So that resource efficiency is something that also goes back to accelerate our journey to, 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 a green, to green cities. And I think the, 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 the final point on resource efficiency is, is, is innovation and, and you know, economic opportunities. Mm -hmm. when, when, when you begin to see, when, when, we, when we start to practice uh, proper waste management or when we, when we start the journey towards that, you can see how much innovation can come up within that space. I've seen um, people manufacture very interesting things from used tires. And you could almost not tell where that, where, that, where that has come from. I've seen a lot of other things that have been, you know, artworks that have been created from waste management, from um, items that could ordinarily, that would ordinarily have ended up on, on, on landfill. I think the final point also is um, a, a critical part of green cities or building green cities is, is the city resilience, right? So when in waste management, especially in recycling, we all know how much jobs can be created in that space. Right. We also know how much, how many people make uh, and a livelihood from work and being engaged in the waste management space. And so, if that is strengthened, that resilience is maximized, and that goes goes about to improve how how, how green our city is. And I think the final one is that when waste management, uh, poor waste management, that causes um that that is of course characterized by uh, improper disposal of waste, causes us major uh, impact causes major impact on the environment so for instance it's regular flooding in major cities because the yep. drainage drainways pathways are blocked and then when those happen people lose properties people lose lights and the lights so i think i don't think that this is just um i don't think um, waste management is is, is 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 an important component of this green um acceleration towards green cities, green cities i think it's even the foundation it's, it's foundational to the success yeah yeah. I um, actually uh, adding to what Olaf Percy has been saying, definitely waste as a resource is something that we are looking into it. But uh, what about waste to energy, that segment in Africa and um, your trick, uh, if you can just throw your throw some light. And I also would like to hear from you if there is some anti views on it, but definitely um, waste as a resource and uh, the black soldier fly that you've been talking about, we would want you to highlight it to the audience. Uh, we want to understand that waste as a resource is something which not even not only the African region but we would say all the all other regions specific, specifically if we talk about India as well they have been also uh, deal, uh, you know struggling so uh, if you can just throw some light on that Piotr Yeah uh, you're muted Piotr sorry I uh, sorry yeah yeah of course the the sentence waste to resource uh, as a resource is of course yeah it's part of circular economy but we have to always remember the first and most priority is reduction and prevention and then recovery. But then uh, in order to recover it in a product that is uh, marketable, it also has to be separately collected. And if not, it's not, the impact on plant filling has to be reduced. So, for example, by this, what I said, uh, um, biostabilization, where organic waste is still recovered from uh, residual waste and used as a, let's say, even a landfill layer because it's already stabilized, so it reduces, uh, it emits less, less emissions. But as you ask about, um, yes, as you ask about incineration, so from climate perspective, landfill with, uh, combined with a good separate collection and uh, mixed waste sorting has a, a less CO2 emissions than incineration. Uh, so so it, since climate is so important in all national strategies, NDCs, uh, UN agencies, this is really has to be taken into account before even speaking about waste incineration. And today, uh, Olaposi, you spoke about um, Lagos, and Lagos is one of those cities that on one hand takes, has some interesting ideas towards plastics, 
but you, uh, they also want to build an incinerator. And this is a huge mistake. Even if it is waste to energy incinerator, it is a mistake because it's a linear approach. How can we move towards circularity if we continue another big installation, very costly, for another 20, 30 years? Because that's the time, time of uh, you know, uh, payback of the installation. The waste composition in Africa is mainly organic waste. So why do you want to burn organic waste, which is mainly water? No, you, you don't do that. Lock in effect. So uh, municipalities actually will be locked because if they don't con uh, deliver the certain amounts of waste, and in Lagos, you, uh, they want to plan 7, 700,000 tons um, capacity. It's, it's a lot. If you would get to the zero waste and circular economy strategy, where you really divert a lot of waste from, from la landfilling, or from the uh, disposal, then you will not have this amount of waste. Mm. But uh, the city will have to still pay uh, every year a certain amount, put or pay. If you don't put, you pay. Energy, in 21st century, there are better ways to generate energy than combustion, any combustion. Combustion is always CO2 intensive. There are better ways, you agree. There are re uh, renewable sources. So actually it's a waste of energy because as compared to the embedded energy in products, Waste incineration is only re re recovering a small fraction of heat. And heat, is it really useful in Africa? Maybe in Sweden, yes, but in Africa, not so much. Yeah, you, uh, I will not go into engineering now here, but uh, it's basically not as useful. Pollution, uh, I will not go into here, but even with best uh, techniques on the stack, there is still emissions. And even the moder most modern incinerators in uh, Europe, for example, the REC in the Netherlands, only 10 years old, I think, uh, it was, there was a study, uh, or in Paris, there is a study that they emit a lot of um, dioxins still. So every amount, even small amount of dioxins is harmful. Then in Lagos uh, or in anywhere in Africa, you do you have hazard hazardous waste uh, landfills? Not. And uh, the ashes from landfilling are very toxic, uh, especially the fly ashes. There is no treatment. Uh, so we actually turn something that is not so dangerous by per se, for example, municipal solid waste. It's not dangerous. You turn, turn it into something hazardous by burning it. Even if you reduce the volume, you actually concentrate the, the problems. Um, and, and also, I think uh, one of you said, this is a centralized approach, whether while the solution to waste management is really decentralized. It's also very much about inclusivity. You need to include, uh, uh, engage people, local communities, such as in Dar es Salaam, Buenyokwa, they take, care of their own waste. They find solutions for it because they find value in it and also because they don't want to make their uh, space dirty, uh, as opposed to centralized solutions, which bring huge amounts of waste to one place, but there is, ne there is, there is no, no, never somewhere outside. Yeah? A, a waste incinerator is always a, a next to some community. So why to actually impose uh, those problems to communities? And lastly, incineration is not only burning waste. Incineration is burning jobs and uh, also creativity as compared to recycling, which uh, generates more uh, jobs or even reuse and repair uh, because of the value that you uh, extend in products. So yeah, uh, that was about the waste incineration and really this is not the way forward. The, the example of Addis Ababa, the Repi, there is, there is the, the biggest currently incinerator in Africa. It's a failure, it's a total failure on economic level and also on electricity level. It does not generate any electricity. So uh, even the local electricity company, the national company, the city company of electricity, they don't want to do any, have anything in common with that incinerator because it's a, such a failure. So let's not continue uh, the, this failure in other cities. Yeah. Why has it failed? Why has the project in Ethiopia failed? Because it is an expensive technology in the end. It is not something that comes from Africa. The, the machines, the maintenance, the technology comes from outside. So in order to maintain it in a, in a high standard, maintain the energy generating system, maintaining the emission abatement, abatement systems, you need constant maintenance. And there is not, my, not enough money to do that. And there is not, um, go, governance is also not in place. Uh, you know, uh, things, uh, high, high tech uh, installations um, should not be, uh, the first priority in Africa, because we have better solutions that are cheaper and more sustainable and more inclusive. Um, I have a question for you from Lemesa Wari. Mm -hmm. What effective strategies do you think the transformation uh -huh. solid waste to think 
what sorry what effective mm -hmm. strategies do you think to transform solid waste management in africa in african cities into sustainable practices yeah thanks for this question lamessa you are from ccac focal point i so I, I, I can share one strategy, which is for organic waste. Next to composting, which is uh, well known as a natural process, which is great. I love compost. But there is also a, a technology that is fairly new, relevant, uh, relatively new. It's black soldier flies. It's a kind of enhanced treatment of bio waste, which all gives you the same output as compost, which is a highly nutritious uh, frass, so the, the outputs of larvas. But apart from that, you get larvas, which are full of proteins. They eat all organic waste very efficiently there. And, and you get proteins to feed. So again, to replace uh, soya beans, for example, for pigs or chicken uh, or fish or fish meal and so on, you, you have larvas that are locally produced from local waste. And this is happening all over. We I actually participate in a project with CCAC and uh, GIZ and Prevent Waste Alliance in, in uh, promoting this uh, technology, in uh, assessing feasibility in different cities in, in Africa. And uh, yeah, if there are some uh, enthusiasts also of this technology, or would you, would you like to learn more, uh, please contact me. This is the strategy, Lemesa, that I would promote as one of examples. But again, if we address organic waste, we address a big chunk of the problem in Africa. Thank you. Um, just one more question before I move on to the next panelist, because it's directly related to ASEN. How would the recent published ASEN action plan be leveraged to forge a common approach to solve Africa's waste management issues? Okay, thank you. So it relates to the AUC, African Union Commission Roadmap, done by uh, ASEN Foundation and ASEN Network uh, Indeed, uh, how it can be leveraged is a political commitment. So it is not the, exactly the same as practical solutions, but it's a political commitment which also brings investments and brings funding. And we as uh, civil society organizations and as experts who, whose objective is circular economy, we have to keep uh, the African Union Commission and national governments who approved this uh, report, this uh, roadmap, hold them to account, yeah? Uh, so that uh, so that they really uh, do what they preach, what they do, what they agreed for, or at least by they, at least by channeling the financing in the correct. Way. Thank okay. You. Do you think you'll be able to share with us that action plan? Uh, it's not published yet. Uh, oh, okay. Stay tuned to the African Union Commission and African, yeah, African Union Commission, uh, and they will uh, publish it in different languages. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have a, a question here for Rolf. Um, waste management is the behavior change. So let me start again. Waste management is the behavior change practice. What can we learn from global norms on intervention in global south? So that's from that that um that is from an anonymous um guest and I can't I don't really understand the question that well. So um unfortunately I will just ask Rolf um one of my questions, which may not be as exciting, but um here we go anyway. Um, Rolf, what is the best way to teach people in our communities that waste is a resource? because you're not just found in the cities, you travel to rural areas as well. So um, what do you think will be the best way for us to teach people in both um, um, African cities and rural cities that waste is a resource and um, not only can they generate an income, but they can also um, help the environment as well? Hi, good question. Um... I mean, that's mostly I'm in the rural areas. I just happen to be based in town um, yeah. for now. But it's a, it's a general problem. And people aren't very commercialized in our rural areas. And they don't see opportunities like I do. And mm -hmm. so part of what I do is just go around and show them, well, there's mushrooms there. Those mushrooms, if you took them to this market, you'd be able to get a good price. If you ate them, you'd be healthier. So it's it's... I think partly our our food system has been uh, 
in a way colonized by Western foods. And so people don't see the nutrient value in a lot of what they have. Um, and I think it's the same sort of thing with waste. Uh, you see plastic bags flying across the the countryside and the cattle eat them. And quite often it blocks the intestines and the cattle either don't put on weight or they actually die. Mm. We see this with, uh, with other animals as well, even elephants. Elephants, yeah. Monkeys. Get uh, blocked up. And, and yet you can see those plastic bags have a value if you can get them to the right place. So I think it's often just uh, just helping people see business opportunities and yeah. then imagining um, a collective action to, to make this worthwhile. You, you're talking about, whether you're talking about forest products or whether you're talking about, you know, relatively small amounts of waste, it does, it's not really a business unless you really work as a team and, and work as a community and start aggregating. And I think that's really what's important for us is to try and get people into structures that can just start managing their resources as a whole together and uh, and start harvesting and ag aggregating either <laughs> forest products, as I say, or waste. Waste is a harvestable thing. It's collected. And, uh, you know, we see more and more. We see trucks going around the country collecting all the metals um, from, you know, the last hundred years really lots of stuff goes down to Kafui for reprocessing there's a, a steel factory there and uh, it's incredible I mean every day you'll come across a truck coming from somewhere with a with a whole bunch of steel and I think it's just a matter of time before that moves to to plastic waste and as as um uh as somebody said you know it's it's probably very related to the price of oil and uh, for us it's oil's expensive we're, mm -hmm. we're at the we're not by the coast. It's uh, mm. it's going to be more and more expensive. Um, I've, I've... I think we will have to wrap up. We are already ahead of our uh, schedule time. It's uh, way past 15 minutes now. Uh, is there any uh, concluding from, from you, from all the panelists? I would request because uh, we request everybody to just uh, give a... One sentence. For the answer for the question that I didn't answer is about EPR. So indeed, there are few countries in Africa, such as Kenya, even Zambia is starting EPR. Uh, in in Nigeria, um, in, in in Tanzania as well, in many few few other uh, even uh, South Africa, Mauritius. The problem is always implementation, but it is mandatory. It is really mandatory. It is key. It will not solve all the problems, of that, but it is key to balance those costs. When we speak about uh, high prices or low prices of oil, the 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 EPR must balance this this uh, unfavorable situation where recycling does not uh, is not economically viable. So EPR is bringing back the economic viability and it's mandatory. It's it's been proved in Europe. So uh, it is also one of the big recommendations in the African Circular Economy Roadmap. Thank you. Hola, Posi. Thank you. So my concluding remark would be um, the work whilst we now. All agree that there's a lot that can be done um, from by the government, but also by the by the people. Um, we will continue to do um, what needs to be done in terms of ensuring that policies that the government are developing or uh, you know planning um, fits with the or align with what the what 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 is expected to be suitable for the for the. For the, for the households who, who are the major gener generators of this, uh, or major sources of this of this waste. Um, just on the point that um, Piotr made around Lagos building building and incineration um, facility, I'm aware that a conversation also still ongoing around whether that's that's a that's a that's whether the benefit in that um, you know outweighs the 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 negative impact on the lights. But again, I believe that. I mean, one of the things that I know that I've learned from working in Lagos on waste, on waste management is the fact that over the years, over the past few years, there's been increasing participation and um, consultation when it comes to this thing. Now that's something that uh, I know that would continue to be very important um, across the different, especially across Africa. Thank you. Um, Rolf, your final remarks, please. Yeah, I think uh, from, you know, my farmer's perspective, Dundi Patak asked a question about, uh, you know, whether the the 
recycled waste, especially um, sewage waste, would be the suitable balance of fertilizer. What we've found in agriculture in our organic matter, and uh, my partner gets the highest yields in Zambia, he's never used a bag of fertilizer or chemicals. Um, he gets three times what the commercial farmers get. So he, he knows what he's doing. And we found that as your organic matter in the soil increases, it buffers all sorts of uh, chemical imbalances in the soil. Um, so we're not worried about the exact uh, component of the of the waste that comes back from from uh, cities. I think we're we're quite confident that it would buffer there um, that that imbalance. The, the nature knows how to sort these imbalances out pretty well. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, all of the panelists. Um, this is my first moderation, but just um, for one minute, I'd just like to say thank you very much for all of your insightful um, um, thoughts and answering the questions. I believe that um, Africa definitely can leapfrog the West when it comes to waste management. I see Africa as a like an artist, a blank canvas, where we can paint a beautiful picture, as long as forums like this, where we can get together, meet new people, discuss, continue to exist in the forum and out the forum, I think we'll definitely succeed. So thank you very much, Be Waste Wise, for hosting these very important um, forums. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nagozika. And I would like to thank uh, all the panelists today for taking time out and sharing your insights and knowledge. Uh, this is the first uh, of the kind of the webinar that we are focusing on the African region and the uh, in the coming weeks, in the coming months, uh, we will be having a series of African-related uh, uh, waste management issues highlighted in our waste dialogues. Uh, so thank you, Nagozika. This was your first uh, moderation, but uh, uh, brilliantly done. Thank you so much for your help and support in that. Uh, as I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on our uh, YouTube, YouTube uh, channel and on our website. Uh, we request you all uh, to, uh, you know, make sure, I mean, we, we will make sure that all the questions that you have posted uh, will be passed on, uh, will be passed on to the moderator, uh, to the moderator, as well as to the panelists for sure. And uh, they will be answered in due course of time. We Because of the lack of time, uh, we are uh, not able to answer them uh, on you know here live on live on the webinar but uh, we make sure that these are being passed on to the moderator and also to the panelist uh thank you so much again for taking time out for all the attendees have a good day thank you thank, thank you, you.